Hey guys, it's the Vilos Most Excellent here, and thank you for checking out my video. I'm gonna be talking about dualism and how it's really the religion of the elite, the Illuminists, the so-called Illuminati, and the various organizations that might fall under that umbrella term, of, you know, like the Freemasons, Knights Templar, Skull and Bones, Gnostics, which, you know, the Freemasons are just Gnostics, they just go by another name now. Satanists, which, you know, the Satanists, they have their Baphomet symbolism, which Baphomet is the very epitome of dualism. He represents about every dualistic aspect that you can think of. And, you know, there's a little bit of this in the New Age movement, and obviously in Wicca with its god and goddess worship. And, you know, this stuff is found all over the place in all kinds of worldviews, like Taoism and just Chinese philosophy in general with the yin and the yang. You know, that's dualism. But really one of the main focuses of this video will be me trying to show this elitist group, these Illuminati, how they put their religious beliefs directly into pop culture through movies, video games, and things like that. And, you know, I want to explain a little bit what their belief system is so that you can recognize it and see it for what it is because it's a religion it's their belief system and just like any other religion or belief system it can be evaluated and critiqued and the reason no one's done that so far is because it's esoteric it's hidden knowledge they keep it secret for just this reason to avoid it being utterly refuted because when someone takes their crazy religious beliefs, like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses, and they take them out into the public, what happens? Over a period of time, people just come along, you know, that have their own belief system, and they look at that, and they say, well, this part of it is just irrational, doesn't make sense. And the same thing can be done with the Illuminati and their religious belief. So the first thing I'm going to do is explain what they believe, but also keep in mind they don't just put it out there like it's just something you can watch and be like, well, there it is, that's what they believe. It's always secretive, hidden, esoteric, the way that they do things. It's, you know, it's sneaky, even. And like I was saying, there's a few reasons for why they do that. One is so that no one can critique what they're saying. And then even when you do critique it, people think you're a madman because you're seeing these things in movies or whatever content they're putting it in. And another reason for keeping it hidden and secret is their ego. They think that they're special. They're the illuminated ones, the enlightened ones. Even while I'm recording this, I'm using, like, quotation fingers. <laughs> but they take great pride in the fact that they have this special knowledge. And for people outside, it makes it more appealing, actually, when it's this mystery and this secret that you get to know. And it almost overrides the fact that it's utter nonsense, you know? That everything that they're saying is completely irrational. It overrides that, the fact that it's this hidden secret that you get to know. And so, let me show you what they believe, and then after that, I'll critique it like it should have been a million times by now. But let me define dualism really quick. In the way that they believe it, it means the equality of opposites. And not only that, it also means that the existence of one thing hinges upon the existence of its opposite. So it's almost like the two opposites are one whole. You can't have one without the other. Like, you'll always hear them saying things like, you can't have good without evil, or you can't have light without dark. And so, like, the yin and the yang would be a perfect representation of that. You have these two opposites that form one whole, and that's how they view reality that reality is made up of opposites and that these opposites form our reality and that if you took one of the opposites away you wouldn't be able to have the other one but most people who get into studying this kind of topic with the whole illuminati and the many facets of that have already noticed these dualistic portrayals in the content that they're making and i would say it goes beyond that it's not just about the traditional dualism that most people are thinking about it's not just about equality of opposites it's not just about opposites balancing one another out no it, it goes beyond that so what they believe is kind of like the hegelian dialectic so in the Hegelian dialectic, you have the thesis, and then you have its antithesis. So you have something, and then it's opposite, essentially. But then in the Hegelian dialectic, it doesn't stop there. Those don't just sit there opposed to each other. In the Hegelian dialectic, you merge the two, the thesis and the antithesis, and you achieve 
synthesis from that. It's like you take the two opposites, you combine them and merge them into one. And don't get me wrong here, this isn't like the yin yang, where you have, you know, the white side and the black side, and there's a little bit of the yin in the yang, or a little bit of yang in the yin. No. What they're talking about is actually commingling all of it. They would take the white side and the black side and just completely amalgamate all of it into one so that you would almost have like a gray circle and that's all that would be left. They're not talking about the balancing of opposites. They're talking about taking opposites and making them into one new whole. So that's the difference between your traditional dualism and what they're teaching. And they call this the great work. Aleister Crowley taught this and you know, people that influenced him and all kinds of people in the occult have been teaching this for a long time. That essentially, and here's the big kicker, the thing that they won't tell you, they believe that when you finish this great work and what the great work is, is combining and merging, synthesizing all opposites into one whole and they believe that when you complete this great work that you'll achieve apotheosis that man will become god and even that in and of itself is the same dualism that we were just talking about god and man are complete opposites and that's what they're trying to achieve with the great work they're trying to merge the two and make them one but the crazy thing is how they actually plan to accomplish all this and you have to view it through the eyes of Gnosticism because like I said they're Gnostics and what Gnostics believe is the physical realm is actually just a construct it's not the real realm there's actually a realm above it filled with gods and goddesses and the lowest of all the gods and goddesses Sophia created the Demiurge and Demiurge means the creator the Demiurge is the one who created this construct the physical realm and they would say that he is the god of the Old Testament and they would say also that he's a deceiver he's trying to deceive mankind into believing that he's the only god and actually the Gnostics would say there are many gods and goddesses above him and actually there's another realm beyond the play Roma where the source god I wouldn't even call him god because he's not a person he's actually just a force and essentially everything comes out from him all those gods and goddesses down the line come from him what they believe about the Demiurge though is that he's dualistic in and of himself he's composed of opposites he's chaos and order he's both evil and good and so they'll view this one whole demiurge as if he consists of these two opposing forces and the one side would be evil and order which order to them is kind of a negative thing and they view it as kind of a breach of nature of the natural way of things and then you have the good and chaotic side and the evil and orderly side would be represented by Yahweh the God of the Old Testament who they more often refer to as Adonai which Adonai is a Hebrew word that you're gonna find over and over again in the Old Testament it's the word Lord it's the capital L lowercase ORD the all uppercase Lord that would be Yahweh and then they would see the personification of good and chaos as being oddly enough Lucifer and you know this all goes back to that Lucifer mythos I was was talking about in my Owl and Baphomet video where the serpent is the hero in Gnosticism. He comes and he rescues mankind. He sets them free from their enslavement to Adonai. And I know some of you are probably thinking, like, how could anybody believe that? It's practically Satanism. And so I want to show some quotes from some high-level Freemasons who are very respected in Freemasonry. A lot of times people will disavow Albert Pike, though, because his writings are so clear and right to the point that, you know, they basically have to disavow him or else they look like Satanists. So don't be swayed by people who tell you that Albert Pike doesn't represent what Freemasonry teaches and all that stuff. Because half the time the people who tell you that... They may be Freemasons, but they're probably very low-level Freemasons, and they haven't been initiated into the kind of things that Pike and other high-level Freemasons, 33rd degree Freemasons, had knowledge of. I'll link a video in the description that pretty much destroys that. But this is what he says. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God, for the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black, for the absolute can only exist as two gods. 
And so you can see that just stinks of that dualism that I was talking about before. And there you have Adonai and Lucifer as the two gods. And then he continues on at the bottom. The true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, god of light and god of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. And there you have Albert Pike pretty much preaching that Lucifer is the savior of mankind, that he's the one that's trying to set them free from the evil Adonai, the god of the Old Testament. But just to show that this isn't some special doctrine only taught by crazy Albert Pike, here's another quote from a 33rd degree Freemason. His name is Domencio Margiota. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. He says that Palladism, which Palladism would come from the Greek word Palos, which that's a Greek goddess, goddess of wisdom. She's basically synonymous with Minerva and Athena. And, you know, that connects back to my Owl and Baphomet video having to do with the Lucifer mythos and the whole flame of wisdom. And that's why they're calling themselves the Illuminati. They're illuminated, enlightened by wisdom. That's from Lucifer. But he says, Palladism is necessarily a Luciferian rite. Its religion is Manichaean Neo-Gnosticism, teaching that the divinity is dual and that Lucifer is equal of Adonai, with Lucifer the god of light and goodness struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. And so, you see it's the same exact thing that Albert Pike was saying, but here even it goes a little bit farther. It's saying that it's dual, that they're one whole. They're not just these two separate gods. It's that they're one whole god together. They're dualistic. And that's one of the reasons they are trying to accomplish the great work. And like I said, the great work is synthesizing all opposites. And the reason they want to do that is because the Demiurge's creation reflects him. It reflects his duality. So that this physical realm that we live in, the construct that he created, it essentially is made up of many, many, many dualistic elements. And you have the mind and the body. You have the male and the female. You have light and dark, fire and water. Many opposing forces is what makes up his domain and they think that if they collapse all these dualistic elements if they synthesize them and merge them all together into one that eventually it'll collapse his realm and not only his realm it'll collapse him in on himself and he will cease to exist and that will open the gate the door the portal to the higher realm where the play Roma is and that's all the aeons the gods and goddesses that come out from the source who the Gnostics would call the father or the pneuma which means spirit in Greek and essentially when they achieve synthesis of all things in this realm then it will collapse in on itself it will destroy the Demiurge and it will free mankind from this prison that he has ensnared them in and then they will ascend into the higher realm and merge with the play realm where they will become aeons gods and goddesses and essentially when Lucifer in the garden told them ye shall be as gods that's what they think he meant when they say they're illuminated ones, that's what they're referring to. They have that knowledge. And this all comes from Sophia, which Sophia means wisdom. And she is essentially behind Lucifer in the garden saying that. And she sent Jesus with this gnosis to help us to escape the snare of the Demiurge. And you would think that that's kind of odd that the Demiurge would be in on destroying himself. But you have to remember that Lucifer is the chaotic side of the Demiurge. He actually takes joy in destruction, in undoing things, in rebellion. And so he He's actually rebelling against himself. And you also have to remember that Lucifer is the good part of the Demiurge, so he sympathizes with the humans because he realizes that their enslavement to the Demiurge is wrong, and so he actually wants to free them. And again, just to show you that I'm not making this stuff up as I go, I'm going to quote to you from a Gnostic text that was found at Nag Hammadi, and it's called On the Orge of the World, so you can go look it up for yourself, but it says this in there. She, and that would refer to Sophia, will cast them down into the abyss. They, and here they refers to the Archons, which are kind of like the Demiurge's henchmen that he created for himself. Uh, so they will be obliterated because of their wickedness, for they will come to be like volcanoes and consume one another until they perish at the hand of the Prime Parent. Prime parent there refers to the Demiurge who created them. But then it says, when he has destroyed them, he will turn against himself and destroy himself until he ceases to exist. And so you can see that this ancient Gnostic text is actually teaching the exact same thing I was saying, that the Demiurge actually destroys himself in the end. But I'm sure some of you are sitting there by now and thinking, this is absolutely insane. 
and I would agree with that diagnosis 110% because <laughs> it is insane. But I'm sure also some of you are a bit confused because this whole topic is pretty mind-numbing with the Numa and the Playroma and Sophia, the Demiurg, all these things may be new to some of you. And so I will leave a link in the description below to a video where Dr. Michael Heiser does like an eight-hour seminar on Gnosticism. And he explains all those things that I was talking about, the Demiurg and the Playroma and the Source, the Father, Numa, Spirit thing, lots of other stuff. I know I said it's eight hours, but in the introduction, he goes over those things pretty quickly. And so the link will just be in the description. But now I want to jump into the section where I actually show you by looking at the content that they actually create, like movies and TV shows and video games, that these are the things that they believe. Because it's a lot easier to simply say that they believe these crazy things than to actually show it. So I actually want to take a look at all these things that they're producing so that you can see they're putting these ideas into their content. And the reason that they are doing that is because they want to slowly indoctrinate more and more people. It's like when you tell a fictional story and it's nonsensical, at first people reject it offhandedly. But the more you tell it and the more you put it in front of them, especially in this way, like subconsciously, they're speaking and teaching you on a subconscious level that these things are not absurd, that it's not crazy to think this. And that's how they get you. They keep showing it to you over and over and over and over again until finally, because you've seen it so many times, it starts to seem plausible like that actually could be the way it is. That could be the truth. But in reality, it's just that same absurdity from before it's just now been wrapped in something appealing and that is your favorite movie or your favorite game or your favorite book or your favorite TV show so that essentially what they've done is they've sugarcoated this lie this absurdity that if you would have heard it on its own you would have rejected it wholeheartedly but now they bring it to you wrapped in bows and you swallow the whole thing sugarcoatedness and the poisonous center the lie the absurdity that you would have never accepted on its own so to begin just let me list here some content that is generally considered to have Gnostic elements in it. Uh, what I've tried to do here though is categorize them by each individual Gnostic element that appears in it. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but it should give you some idea of how prevalent this kind of thing is in Hollywood. I mean, a lot of these are huge multi-million dollar movies. You'll notice though that the most reoccurring theme is the Gnostic construct idea. I think the reason you see that one more than anything else is because they use it as a kind of fear tactic to manipulate people. I mean, think about it. They're propagating this fear of being trapped in some kind of uber prison. I mean, that's probably a huge reason for the explosion of Orwellian type movies in general. They achieve that same kind of fear without the obvious Gnostic overtones found in these movies I've listed. It's all about creating a fear-filled atmosphere though, so that eventually they can cash in on that by revealing what they'll call the true Orwellian nightmare, the universal Big Brother, which would be the construct. They're basically embedding in people's minds this overwhelming urge to escape even before they really know what they have to escape from or whether they're actually even trapped in the first place. And this really sets up people to more readily accept Gnosticism since Gnostic teaching then becomes the cure to the disease that the Gnostics intentionally infected the public with in the first place. But I want to single out some of these that I listed and show how some of the deeper things that I talked about are actually expressed in them. I don't really have time to touch on them all. This video is probably going to run long enough as it is. So I'll leave a link in the description to Good Fight Ministry video called Hollywood's War on God, which is all about exposing Gnosticism in movies. So check that out if you're interested in more stuff like this. So the first movie I want to jump to is The Matrix, which it's actually a trilogy of movies, but as most of you probably already know, it all starts out with the main character, Neo, being unknowingly trapped in a type of computer simulation of Earth known as The Matrix. It's even called a prison for the mind by one of the characters. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. But you have some duality symbolism sprinkled throughout the Matrix movies, like checkerboard flooring, the famous red and blue pill scene from the first Matrix, and one character even wears yin-yang earrings in the third movie, which is significant when you realize the Gnostic character she's playing. But you have the Demiurg from Gnosticism making an appearance in the second and third movies. The character called the Architect is essentially this machine or program that's the creator of the Matrix and who has enslaved all mankind within it. Though in the second movie, he actually speaks about a co-creator. I am the Architect. I created the Matrix. 
the Oracle. If I am the father of the Matrix, she would undoubtedly be its mother. And she's actually the one I mentioned who wears the dualistic earrings, the yin-yangs. But these two co-creators seem to portray the Gnostic belief in the dual demiurge that I was talking about before. But what's more is that the name architect for the demiurge character is pretty telling and more than appropriate since demiurge can be translated into many English words like architect. For example, it could be translated as fashioner or artisan, craftsman, creator, designer, and plenty of other synonyms of words like those which would obviously include architect. So, architect is definitely one way to refer to the Gnostic Demiurge. But even more telling is that the Freemasons, who as I said in the beginning are just neo-Gnostics, neo meaning new, but they actually refer to the Demiurge as the Grand Architect, so it would seem that at least some Gnostics prefer the translation. But the architect in the movie is portrayed as this calculating, evil genius whose only flaw is his obsession with perfection. The first Matrix I designed was quite naturally perfect. It was a work of art, flawless, sublime. A triumph equaled only by its monumental figure. I have since come to understand that the answer used may be because it required a lesser mind, or perhaps a mind less bound by the parameters of perfection. While the Oracle's character is portrayed as much more of a free spirit, you know, smoking cigarettes, baking cookies, and occasionally assisting humans in the upheaval of the Matrix she helped to create. So, she's rebelling against the system she helped put in place. Sounds slightly familiar. You know, like Lucifer, supposed co-demiurge, yet notorious rebel who's fighting for mankind against his dualistic counterpart. But that's not all. The rabbit hole goes deeper still. And yes, that was a Matrix pun. <laughs> So in the third and final movie, we come to a point where Neo actually approaches the physical architect that resides outside the Matrix, known as the Deus Ex Machina, which quite fittingly literally means God out of the machine. But the first time Neo met the architect, it was in the second movie, and he was within the Matrix, and let's just say he was much more pleasant. So essentially, long story short, Neo enters the Matrix by being plugged directly into the Deus Ex Machina, or the architect, essentially becoming tethered to him while inside the Matrix. It's kind of like he's walking around with the architect inside him or something, but simultaneous to all this, Neo's arch nemesis throughout the movies, uh, Agent Smith, has basically, I guess, possessed or assimilated is a way to say it, every single person in the Matrix. But the last person we see him assimilate is the Oracle character. The great and powerful Oracle. So essentially both Neo and Smith in the Matrix have become the host bodies for the two aspects of the dual Demiurge. Then there's this huge fight between Neo and Smith, and in the end, Agent Smith assimilates Neo, and he merges with him in a sense. But essentially, when Smith does this, Neo, like the others who have been assimilated, morphs into a kind of clone of Agent Smith. Then we see a scene that's outside the Matrix where the architect, the Deus Ex Machina, shoots this light into Neo's actual body, and it goes into the Matrix and comes out of the assimilated Neo. Then, the Smith clone that had assimilated the Oracle, and who was fighting with Neo this whole time, he begins to do the same thing, and eventually bursts into a massive explosion of light, and then all these onlooking Agent Smiths, who were clones, they've just been watching this fight the whole time, they follow suit, and they all begin to explode in perfect unison. So in the end, this kills both Neo and Smith, but it frees the human population trapped in the Matrix. So if you're paying attention, we see nearly every element I mention is in play here. We have the obvious allusion to the construct in the form of the Matrix. We have the dual demiurge in the form of the Oracle and the Architect, who, based upon their characteristic personalities, obviously allude to Adonai and Lucifer. And then we have their being synthesized together through the merger of Neo and Smith, the two demiurge's incarnations, in a sense, which ends in their destruction and brings about the freedom of mankind from the construct, the Matrix. So you see, that's quite in step with what I was talking about. But another movie that shows similar elements to these is Tron, legacy. So in this one you have the creator of what's called the Grid, whose name is Flynn, and at one point he's even called a deity. Together, we have achieved a great many things. We have created a vast complex system. We have rid it of its imperfection. Not to mention, rid it of the false deity who sought to enslave us. Heaven Flynn! Where are you now? 
But then you have his co-creator, Clue, who Flynn actually made to help him, quote, create the perfect system, which is referring to his task of maintaining the grid. And this so-called grid is essentially a digital universe within a computer. So clearly in that, you have the construct idea again, and with Flynn and Clue, you have the dual Demir concept as well. But eventually, Flynn's co-creator, Clue, backfires on him, and he ends up betraying him because of his obsession with perfection and order. Yet, counter to this, Flynn is portrayed as another free-spirited type hippie guy who's constantly spouting Buddhist philosophy. So he, like the Oracle, would seem to portray the Luciferian, chaotic half of the Demiurge. Chaos. Good news. There's also this dualistic color scheme of opposing oranges and blues that's all throughout the movie. And of course, orange characters are always bad guys, and blue characters are always good guys. But Clue, after his betrayal, always appears in orange, and Flynn always appears with this blue theme. So anyway, after Clue's betrayal, Flynn becomes trapped in the grid, and then his son also finds his way and becomes trapped. And in the end, the only way his son is able to escape the grid is by Flynn merging with his co-creator, Clue, a process referred to as reintegration in the movie. How can he be so afraid of his own creation? I mean, he's built Clue. Why doesn't he just end him? He could, but it would require reintegration. Yeah, all right. Flynn would never survive the event. It would mean the end of them both. And to reintegrate literally means to bring together, to combine divided parts into a single whole, which is obviously the synthesis idea again. But when the two dramatically reintegrate with one another at the end, as expected, they both die by this massive explosion, which ends up destroying the grid and allows for Flint's son to escape through what's called, quote, the portal in the movie. So again, here we see the dualistic Demiurge synthesis resulting in his demise as well as the destruction of the Construct. But we also see an allusion to man's escape from the Construct and his ascension to the higher realm in the form of the sun's escape. There's also this telltale sign of Gnostic influence in the movie that I can't help but point out before moving on. Head towards the light, Cora. This is a sign from the Pleroma that you can come back, just follow the light. Isn't that a nice phrase we've all heard in our, in our culture? Follow the light. Uh, it's Gnostic. You follow the light and you will make it back to the Pleroma. But another film with some of these same elements is the Lego movie. The movie is centered around a Lego character named Emmett, who is supposedly the chosen one, or something. But he runs around throughout the movie with his little Lego friends, trying to stop this evil Lego villain called President Business, who is also called Lord Business. As you can probably guess, it's more of a kid's movie. But we find out at one point that the Lego universe that the movie has taken place in up to this point is actually just this huge Lego set in the basement of some guy's house, and that all the Lego characters that appeared up to the now are just Lego figurines in this guy's massive Lego set. So in that, we have this allusion to the construct in the form of the Lego world this guy has made in his basement. Then our world plays the role of the play Roma, that is, the higher realm again. Which in this higher realm, we have the creator of the Lego set, or the Demiurg, if you will, played by the comedic actor Will Ferrell. He's really just what looks like an average business guy who seems to have an addiction to Legos, but he's literally called the man upstairs a ton of times throughout the movies by these Lego figurines which is an obvious illusion him being the god figure to these inhabitants of the Lego universe. If the man upstairs chose him to be the special, there must be a reason. Who's the man upstairs? See, he doesn't even know about the man upstairs. Doesn't he have like super gross hands that look like they're made out of big pink sausages? Like eagle talons mixed with squid? Wait, you've seen the... The man upstairs. But it's also at this point that we find out that this guy's son has actually been tampering with his Lego set, building all kinds of things in the Lego universe without his father's permission. And the dad actually gets pretty upset because he's obsessive about keeping his Legos in perfect order. And his son is actually pretty chaotic when he's playing with them. Oh no, no, this is a disaster. All of this that you see before you is all your father's. And everything is thought out. It's a highly sophisticated interlocking brick system. What am I holding here? It's a battleship. No, it's a hodgepodge. That's what it is. What's Batman doing? What is this a robot pirate? 
And so the son is obviously portrayed as being more free-spirited, promoting Lego anarchy by making a mess of his dad's Lego set. But obviously in this father and son creator duo, we have another allusion to the dual demiurge. And they obviously have those familiar chaotic and orderly personalities attributed to Adonai and Lucifer by the Gnostics. Similar to the Matrix though, the father and son seem to have their own representative in the Lego universe. The father's representative is the villain, Lord Business, who is actually voiced by the same actor as the dad, Will Ferrell, and they both have the same perfectionist-like mentality. All the people of the universe were once free to travel and mingle and build whatever they wanted. But President Business was confused by all the chaos, so he erected walls between the worlds and became obsessed with order and perfection. All I'm asking for is total perfection. The son's representative seems to be Emmett, though. I say this because at the end, when the son and his dad are reconciling, Lord Business and Emmett are simultaneously reconciling. The father figure even asks his son, quote, if the construction guy, referring to Emmett, said something to President Business, what would he say? And he actually does this in an attempt to get his son to tell him what's bothering him. But then it cuts to Emmett appealing to Lord Business about not being so obsessive about the order of the Lego universe, which is simultaneously meant to be the son's appeal to the dad not to oppress his playing with his Lego set. Then there's this scene where they're reconciled and the dad hugs his son, and simultaneously in the Lego universe we see Lord Business hugging Emmett. So pretty clearly Emmett represents the son's character. But I think this event where the son and the father reconcile and unite in a hug is meant to picture that synthesis of the two demiurge figures. Though obviously it's much more watered down than the other portrayals we've seen of it. But after this, and a bit of an explosion, the Lego universe and its inhabitants are freed from the oppression of Lord Business and his stringent rules about what they can and can't build. And the father also then allows his son to continue his chaotic building with his Lego set. Really, I could do an entire commentary on this movie explaining how Luciferian it is, but for time's sake, I'll just outline the allusions to the elements we've been discussing. So we saw the construct portrayed in the form of the Lego universe. We saw that its Lego inhabitants were oppressed by a perfectionist type Adonai character, who's actually called Lord throughout the film. Lord being the literal translation of Adonai. We also had his son playing the role of the chaotic rebel and co-creator Lucifer, together the two representing the dual demiurge figure that we've discussed. And in the end, the two are unified, which frees the Legos and the construct from oppression. And so yet again, we find many of those same elements here. But the last one I'll mention briefly is actually a video game from the Elder Scrolls series. Elder Scrolls is probably best known for its fifth installment called Skyrim, but the game I'm going to address is the fourth installment, Oblivion, specifically the Shivering Isles add-on. And an add-on, for those who don't know, basically means it wasn't a part of the original game when it first came out, but it was released later as a downloadable addition to the game. So the add-on's name, Shivering Isles, actually refers to the location where the events of the storyline take place. It's essentially this island that the player reaches by teleporting out of the original game world and into the so-called Oblivion Realm. Oddly enough, though, the island is highly dualistic in nature because it's actually split into two opposing halves. One half is called Mania and the other Dementia, and the Dementia side of the island is always gloomy and filled with bogs and marshland and stuff like that, while the Mania half of the island looks like this beautiful lush forest and fall. I mean, even many of the enemies you find are actually color-coded to match the specific region they inhabit. So you may find the same monster on either side of the island, but it'll be darker colored if it's in Dementia and lighter if you find it in Mania. But there's even this dualistic city at the center of the island, and it's split right down the middle between the two districts called Bliss, which is the mania half of town, so it's always bright and cheery. But then there's Crucible, which is the dementia half, so it's pretty much like a sewer runoff. And then there's the palace grounds part of the city, where the dualism continues, and again, it's split right down the middle between the two districts. Then there's the throne room, which you can see is also highly dualistic, but in it sits the ruler of the Shivering Isles, Shagorath. And Shagorath in the game is actually what's called a Daedric Prince, which is essentially a deity of sorts, but specifically he's referred to as the Daedric Prince of Madness, which makes perfect sense because he's quite insane and has an odd obsession with cheese. Time for a celebration! Cheese for everyone!
Hence, he's actually called the Mad God many times throughout the game. Beyond that, his personality is that of a lover of chaotic mischief and disarray, and what's more, he's actually the creator of this dualistic island. So here again, we obviously have allusions to the Demiurge and his creation, the Construct. But as with the others, the Gnostic overtones don't stop there. So the player, pretty soon after beginning the Shivering Isles storyline, finds out that the island and its inhabitants are in danger from some enemy of Sher Gorath's. This enemy is called Jigalag, and he's supposedly the Daedric Prince of Logical Order. The Daedric Prince of Order. Or biscuits. No, no order. Yeah. And he actually plans on capturing the island, destroying it, and then recreating it in perfect order. And so again, we have what seems like the Gnostic portrayal of Adonai and Lucifer in the form of these two enemies. One being the chaotic rebel and the other being this obsessive perfectionist. And yet the plot thickens. The player eventually learns that Sheagorath and Jiglag are actually the same person. So Sheagorath, the Prince of Madness, at the end of every supposed era, in werewolf-like fashion, he turns into this Prince of Order Jiglag, and he destroys his own creation in the hopes of re-establishing it in perfect order. Ah, is dead! All shall crumble before Jigalag! So the two characters actually turn out to be the same person. And so this construct-like realm of Sheagorath is simultaneously the realm of Jigalag. And so yet again, we have this allusion to the dualistic Demiurge. Though the game does seem to lack an obvious concept of the two being united through some kind of synthesis. But technically, since they're the same person anyway, they're already unified in some sense. Nevertheless, the game does play another card from the Gnostic teaching I discussed earlier. When you defeat Jigalag, oddly enough, your in-game character becomes comes the mad god Sheagorath. You now hold the mantle of madness. I will take my leave, and you will remain here, mortal. Mortal, king, god, it seems uncertain. This realm is yours. Fare thee well, Sheagorath, prince of madness. So, essentially, the player becomes the god of the Shivering Isles. There's even a character in the game who literally calls this process apotheosis. You seek the throne of madness. However, no mortal may sit upon the throne without the staff. But apotheosis is no simple matter, and the creation of the staff is no simple task. So think about this. Here we have embedded in this game the Gnostic teaching that upon defeating Jigalag, who is an obvious portrayal of Adonai, that you become a god yourself. This sounds too much like what Satan told Eve in the garden, that men can become gods. I mean, is it any wonder why these Gnostics have to be so shady about all this? Obviously no one's going to accept this kind of stuff outright. That's why they have to hide it in their content like this. They're doing this to precondition the masses to accept this kind of satanic ideology without even knowing it. But from there, I want to point out some other familiar content that you can see these same kinds of ideas popping up in. So to begin, in Freemasonry, you have the very crest of their organization, seemingly representative of this dual demiurge. And so if you look at it, you see the compass and the square set opposite one another, which the two actually represent opposites in architecture. One is used to produce curved lines, and the other right angles. They appear to be merging together, though, to form what looks like a hexagram. Which you can see in this piece of Masonic art, they actually portray the same symbolism using an actual hexagram. Hexagram itself, though, is a symbol of the merger of opposites, like that of Earth and Heaven, or the microcosm and the macrocosm, or even man and God. Which there are many symbols out there that represent the same kind of idea. But notice in this hexagram, though, that the merger of the two opposite halves is being stressed by showing them as interlocking with one another. But the hexagram as a symbol quite literally means as above, so below, which is a concept found in Hermeticism and sacred geometry. And so, of course, it finds a place in the syncretism of Gnosticism. The phrase, though, originates with the 6th to 8th century pseudepigraphical work called the Emerald Tablet. second line of which reads, that which is below corresponds to that which is above, and that which is above corresponds to that which is below, to accomplish the miracle of the one thing. Which, this seems to be alluding to the merger of the microcosm and the macrocosm, as I mentioned before, apparently for the purpose of accomplishing the quote, one 
thing. Strange way of putting it, but it seems to be saying the below and the above are unified to become one whole, which is obviously just another occult teaching about the great work. But back to the Freemasonic seal, and you can see the capital G in the center of the compass and square, which stands for Grand or Great Architect. And as I mentioned earlier, Architect is synonymous with the word Demiurge being an appropriate translation for it. I also get the sneaking suspicion, though, that it may double as an abbreviation for the Great Work, which would also be well represented by the merger of the opposing compass and square, which in the end, the purpose of the Great Work is to synthesize smaller opposing forces leading up to the ultimate synthesis of the Demiurge. So really, either way, it's an allusion to the same thing. Another thing, though, that might actually hint towards this being an allusion to that dual Demiurge is a symbol that I actually noticed in the House of the Temple, which is a Freemasonic temple in Washington, D.C. And this isn't just any Freemasonic temple, it's actually the headquarters of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, and the bones of Albert Pike are actually entombed there at that temple. And so yet again, those Freemasons who want to disavow Elder Pike, I mean, they have that to wrestle with, that Elder Pike is actually entombed at such a highly recognized Freemasonic temple there in Washington, D.C. But the thing I want to point out in that temple is that there's actually this rare compass and square Freemasonic symbol on one of the walls there. It's in between two hexagrams. But the reason I say that the symbol is rare is because if you look at it in the picture here, you can see the square on the bottom is elongated on the left half. Now, that's not rare for a square because you see squares all the time that are longer on one end than another but it is rare for the freemasonic compass and square to look this way because i went through pictures of countless freemasonic compass and squares and i only found a few that looked like this but the reason i point that out is because i'm actually willing to wager that the elongation of that left half is very intentional it's because they're trying to make the square appear as if it is an l and the reason they're doing that is because they're abbreviating for one half of the Demiurge, Lucifer. And then the top half of the seal would allude to the A in Adonai. And so there you have Adonai and Lucifer merging together. And I'm sure there's probably some Freemason watching this saying, that's not at all what it means. And I would say to that, well, how do you know? It's a secret society that keeps secrets, even from its own members. I mean, look at the highest degree you can earn. It's literally called Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. Hmm. You really think you know the, quote, royal secret that the 32nd degree Mason has privilege to? I'm willing to bet you don't. In fact, I'm willing to bet even the 32nd degree Mason isn't privileged to know all the secrets of Freemasonry. Matter of fact, I'm willing to bet a Mason learns something new with every single rank he gains. So I really don't want to hear Freemasons pretending to speak in some kind of place of authority about Freemasonry, because frankly, you voluntarily had the wool pulled over your eyes as soon as you join a secret society. They keep secrets. That's their thing. What makes you think they don't keep secrets from you? So anyways, the seal here seems to be a very clear allusion to the synthesis of two opposites, and beyond that, it's even branded with a symbol that admittedly refers to the Demiurge. You can't get much clearer than that. But to really drive the point home that this symbol represents the dual Demiurge, take a look at these sketches by the infamous occultist Elphos Levi. The one on the right is pretty basic. It's like a diamond split in half with two opposing faces, likely the opposed Demiurgs. But you also have the clashing color scheme reflected one against another. And you can actually see some poorly drawn Hebrew letters at the top and bottom of the diamond. The top one looks most like an Aleph, which may be an abbreviation for Adonai, Aleph being the first letter in his name in the Hebrew Old Testament. The bottom one, though, could be a misshapen nun, which Nakash, the Hebrew word for serpent used in Genesis 3 to refer to Satan, that begins with the letter nun. Can't really be too sure one way or the other though, since Hebrew here is pretty sloppy. But if that is what these Hebrew letters represent, then it's kind of like that Freemasonic compass and square that I already showed where it abbreviated for Adonai and Lucifer. And so this could be a similar thing. But you can see the picture on the left is actually a hexagram, which is clearly portraying the two opposing Demiurge figures and merging together in the center. And you can also see written in Latin at the top right corner, macrocosm, and in the bottom left corner, microcosm. Also in the top left corner is the Latin phrase meaning the top 
top is like the bottom or more loosely as above so below so again we have obvious allusions to the great work here but something new you see there is the serpent around the outer edge and it's forming a circle and it's eating its own tail and that's called the Ouroboros which hopefully I'm pronouncing that right but the symbol pictures this similar dualistic synthesis in that the snake lives by eating its own tail and so in the occult it represents life being sustained by death the two opposing forces sustaining one another essentially but your children know Ouroboros as the circle of life courtesy of the Lion King so in the symbol we have both life and death coming together as one whole hopefully you're starting to see the pattern here I mean it's over and over again with this idea of the synthesis of opposites the plurality becomes singularity the many become one the disjointed become joined diversity becomes university and over and over and over again we're just bombarded with this kind of synthesis symbolism this all really shouldn't be too surprising though since Elphos Levi is the same occultist behind the infamous Baphomet portrait, which I'm willing to bet this dualistic monstrosity is also an allusion to the synthesized Demiurge, or at the very least, the great work, because it's basically an amalgamation of opposites from head to toe. You have male and female, animal and human, demon and angel, light and dark, the two opposing serpents, potentially alluding to the dualistic tree of knowledge of good and evil from the Genesis narrative, where the serpent tempted Eve, which makes you think it's no wonder occultists have an obsession with dualism. Lucifer's been all about it since day one, hanging out in this dualistic tree. But notice his arms say solve and coagula, which is a Latin phrase, solve meaning separate and coagula meaning join together. And it's an alchemical maxim referring to the fusion of things and disunity, which again is an obvious allusion to the great work. And especially so since Levi himself wrote extensively on the great work. But another dualistic representation of the Demiurge that comes to mind is this early Gnostic picture of carved on a gem, which this is just a facsimile, so it's not really the same quality as the original. But notice the opposing moon and star, that is moon and sun, because the ancients would often depict the sun in that way. So this would be an allusion to the two opposed forces of night and day. They may actually be depicted as conjoined together, though, behind the figure's head, with the sun rays being obvious, but the crescent may be that thin circle that disappears behind the creature's neck, making a possible allusion to the crescent shape. If you recall, Although Baphomet seemed to have the allusion to the moon and the sun as well. He actually points to the two as if they're what the Latin words on his arms are referring to when they say separate, thus hinting they need to be joined together. Which the sun and moon symbolism seems to be a very common way to refer to the two demiurgs, as we'll see as we get a little farther on. But the demiurg figure here is portrayed as a serpent with lion's head, which the serpent is an obvious allusion to Satan or Lucifer, while Adonai is portrayed as a lion in several passages passages throughout the Old Testament. So here yet again we see the Demir portrayed in this dualistic manner with allusions to both Satan and Adonai. But another Freemasonic symbol that seemingly portrays the dualistic Demir is the two-headed phoenix. Especially since it has that familiar ordo ab chao quote on it. The Latin phrase means order out of chaos. It possibly refers to the opposing personalities of the two Demiurgs, that is, orderly and chaotic. Or it may be synonymous with the United States motto found in the Great Seal, e pluribus unum, meaning out of many one, which sounds oh so familiar again. This is clearly just another allusion to the great work. I mean, you have the combining of a plurality of opposites into a single whole. And so this is likely what the slogan Ordo Op Chao refers to as well. That is, creating an orderly state of oneness out of a mass, chaotic state of opposites. But there's also the two pillars in Freemasonry, and I think here again we have another allusion to the dual demiurg with these, which often you have the two pillars portrayed in this opposing fashion to one another, one pillar being colored white and the other black, or on some rare occasions one pillar will be red and the other will be blue. And the two are actually based off the two biblical pillars, named named Boaz and Jason that are located outside of Solomon's temple. Though in the Bible they're not really depicted as being dualistic in any clear way. In fact, they're barely mentioned at all, really. Another thing about the pillars is the familiar sun and moon symbolism we spoke briefly about before. The two are very often hovering nearby the two pillars, with the sun characteristically near the left pillar and the moon near the right, though in some cases they rest individually upon their corresponding pillars. And as I pointed out before though, the sun and moon seem to represent the two demiurg figures and their opposed natures. Also think about the connection
connection between Lucifer, which means the light bearer, and the moon. A light bearer would refer to something that holds light, like a lampstand, but not an actual source of light, much like the moon and its reflection of the light emitted by the sun. But in other cases, you have the earth on one pillar and a globe containing space on the other. This is a plain reference to the microcosm represented by earth and the macrocosm represented by the heavens. But the way the synthesis of the two demiurges is represented in all this is by connecting the two pillars by application of what's called the royal arch on top of the two. And as you can see in this Freemasonic art, the arch is actually made up of several opposing blocks meant to counterbalance each other's weight until the last block can be placed right there in the center. This all likely represents the process of the great work being carried out. The farther out blocks represent smaller micro opposites that must be synthesized in order to reach the eventual macro synthesis of the Demiurg. Something worth note here though is that the Masonic quote royal secret that I talked about earlier probably relates to this royal arch and what it represents. That is the goal of the great work, the synthesis of the Demir. And so the Freemasonic royal secret probably refers to that. And so you got to get all the way to the 32nd degree to get this kind of knowledge. And so I can't blame the Freemason who hasn't heard of this before. But I'll touch more on the royal arch here in a moment. And so what's symbolized by the placing of an arch upon the pillars is that it goes from just being these two random pillars to creating a doorway or gateway for someone to pass through, which pictures the opening of the portal for the ascension of man, which relates back to what we discussed before, where the two demiurgs being synthesized opens the portal for escape from the construct. This same kind of concept, though, is also pictured in the 101 symbolism that many have pointed out in things like The Matrix or George Orwell's 1984. The ones in the sequence depict the two pillars on either side, that is the two demiurgs, and the zero depicts the portal opening between the two. And you can actually see this kind of symbolism portrayed in some other places. For instance, in the 80s He-Man movie, Masters of the Universe, you have here the two pillars and then the portal in the center, which in the movie the portal is called the Great Eye. I stand before the Great Eye of the Galaxy! More than man! More than life! I... God! And so that eye symbol probably alludes to that portal that they're trying to open through synthesis. But this also connects to two other movies I'd point out. First, you have Ghostbusters, where you see the synthesis of the two opposites, male and female, in the form of the Keymaster and the Gatekeeper, which, of course, results in the opening of the portal. And we also see the gatekeeper and the keymaster seemingly depicted as two pillar figures along with the many other pillars in front of this infamous Illuminati pyramid. But then the portal opens right between the two around the center of the pyramid. And often, in depictions of the triangle and all-seeing eye, the eye will appear at the center of the pyramid, or triangle shape. And so there we have what seems like a portal alluding to an eye, and also the two pillars with the portal between them. And so it's like that 101 symbolism, and also similar to this picture I showed, where you have the pillars and the royal arch representing synthesis, but then you have the eye symbol back there in the background behind the gate, picturing the opening of the portal from this process of synthesis by the application of the royal arch. But then you also have in the movie Stargate, we see that the final symbol used to open the portal is two lines separated at the bottom but converging at the top with a circle at the peak of the two. And so the two lines likely allude to the two pillars, that is the two demiurgs, merging to open the portal above. Well, the seventh actually isn't inside the cartouche, it's just below it here, designated by a uh, little pyramid with two funny neat little guys and funny little 
And the portal being placed above is probably meant to picture the ascension of man when he enters through the portal. And the fact that the two pillars are merging at the top, it just kind of shows you that they're foregoing the picture of the arch. And they're representing the same symbolism. They're just representing it in a different way here. And you notice this is also quite similar to the 101 symbolism as well, just rearranged differently. And that's what I was saying before. They're using very similar symbolism here. It's just being reworked and used in different ways to represent the same thing. But notice it's also an allusion to the familiar eye and triangle symbolism as well, with the representation of the eye resting at the peak of the triangle, like on the back of the dollar bill, which that seal on the back of the dollar bill probably is picturing this exact same thing. I mean, think about it. You start out at the base, you have multiple bricks, and the higher up the structure you go, the less bricks there are. It's picturing the synthesis again until you get up to the portal that takes you to the higher realm. But something else of note here in Stargate is the connection to the Royal Arch. The bracket there on the Stargate seems to point to the center block of the royal arch and it's being the final synthesis of the two pillars because you can see in this picture the two look quite similar notice also the 69 symbol that i pointed out before on the royal arch this is also a symbol of synthesis and the portal also if you think about it and so what i mean is that 69 is often depicted as the merger of male and female which the merger of male and female theoretically results in childbirth and so the reason that's portal symbolism is because the occult will often overlap the opening of the woman's womb with the opening of the portal, if you catch my drift. I mean, they essentially see the child coming out of the womb as an allusion to ascending from a lower form of life to a higher form of life through a type of portal. But 69 can also allude to the yin-yang since the two numbers seem to so effortlessly match the shape. And so you can see the 69 as a number is the perfect symbol to place there at the peak of the royal arch to depict synthesis. Either way, though, it appears exactly where we'd expect to, if this theory of mine is right. Because if you remember, the arch is the very symbol of merger between the two pillars. And this block at the peak is the final block needed to form the arch and complete synthesis. But I would even take this a step farther. If you look at the CERN logo, which CERN is very often associated with portal symbolism, you have the often known as 666, which I would contend is relevant also. But I would point out that there's also a 69 there independent from the 666. And so it's obviously alluding to that synthesis again and the opening of the portal. I mean, not only that, but the whole purpose of the facility is to smash matter into matter. It's a particle collider. So maybe in that you have another connection to the synthesis of opposites. Or not. I don't know. <laughs> but another thing related to the whole pillar symbolism is 9-11 and specifically the Twin Towers. I believe that to the Illuminati or whatever we're calling them, the Twin Towers were symbolic of the two pillars of Freemasonry. One reason I say this is because of the day they chose to destroy them, which if you don't believe that 9-11 was an inside job of some kind, I'd highly recommend that you watch the video I've linked in the description called Loose Change and hopefully you'll at least keep an open mind about it. But the day they chose to destroy them on is significant because 9-11 in Roman numerals is is IXXI. And as you can see, it actually forms a similar shape to the 101 we've already discussed. And as I said then, the 101 represents the two pillars on either side and the portal in the center. And obviously the same is true of this IXXI. So it's the allusion to a portal between the two pillars again. But more than that, we have the synthesis of the two towers, just like the two pillars. And what I mean is the two World Trade Center towers were intentionally destroyed to make way for the one World Trade Center. And yes, that's literally what it's called. Not anything ominous about that. But the One World Trade Center represents what's often called the third pillar, that is, the amalgamation of the first two pillars. And so, again, it's the same idea as the arch being placed on top of the two pillars. It's just another way of representing the same thing. Let me prove my point further, though, about this. Notice in this picture what seems to be an intentional connection made between the layout of the three towers and the layout of the three pyramids in Egypt. The reason I point that out is because the One World Trade Center is actually an elongated square antiprism, which you're you're probably wondering what on earth that means. And so a square antiprism consists of two pyramids that have been unfurled at their highest point and then interlocked one to another, as you can see in this clip. And so what I'm saying is the 
two pyramids that make up the new tower likely represent the twin towers. And so that one World Trade Center is a perfect representation of the two World Trade Center towers being synthesized into a single whole. Also, if that weren't enough, I mean, just think back to what I was saying about the name, the One World Trade Center. This whole ritual behind 9-11 and the tower is bigger than just buildings. It's a symbolic statement. The statement being made here is about the great work on a worldwide scale. Remember, these elite, they think this planet is just a construct and that all of us are just in prison here. And so that's why they want this worldwide amalgamation, not just the combination of two buildings. They don't care about that. This is just a ritual to show their dedication to this great work because they think if they achieve this, they'll destroy the construct along with the Demiurge and then they'll be set free to ascend. And obviously, given the massive death toll incurred on 9-11, they're willing to do just about anything to achieve that goal. And so the statement they're making there is, look, if we're going to kill all these people just to put these two buildings together as some stupid symbol, how much more do you think we're willing to do to finish the actual great work? because part of the great work is not synthesizing two buildings. That's nothing. That's nothing but a ritual. And so that means they're actually hard at work trying to bring about this great work. And so just think about some things that are occurring around you right now on a daily basis. Can you think of any ways that they're working to accomplish this goal in the world today? To show you one, let me just backtrack a tad. Before I mentioned that occasionally the two pillars are portrayed as red and blue, and often they use these types of blue and red as opposing colors for their dualistic symbolism, as we saw in Tron Legacy. But also, remember back to the Hegelian dialectic I showed, the thesis I represented with blue on white, and the antithesis I represented with red on black, but the synthesis I represented with purple on gray. I did this because the combination of black and white is gray, and the combination combination of blue with red is purple. So purple is often used by the Illuminati to represent synthesis or the third pillar. So the reason I say all this is because a few months ago in April, Prince died and Prince was quite famous for his song Purple Rain. So you had purple light shows and all kinds of purple themes everywhere supposedly in his honor. However, Prince at one point in his career seemed to allude to his being made up of two different genders, speaking about the Gemini and what but during our conversation, the artist shared a very personal discovery he's recently made about himself. This is very interesting. A recent uh, analysis has proved that there's probably two people inside of me, just like a Gemini, and we haven't determined what sex that other person is yet. What I'm getting from you is that you are very much in touch with both sides of yourself, your masculine and feminine mm -hmm. side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And always have been. Mm -hmm. And he even admitted at one point that the symbol he used throughout his career was a combination of the symbols for male and female. Yeah. So how did it come about? The symbol came to you, and the symbol is like a combination of female and male? Yes. And of course he was well known for being rather feminine in both his dress and mannerisms. But what I'm saying is, Prince was a symbol to the elite of the synthesis of male and female. At his death, while tragic, it seems to be all too convenient for them and their schemes, since transgenderism is the in thing now. I mean, ask yourself, is this acceptance and more than that, celebration of such a deplorable lifestyle as transgenderism even close to normal? Or does it seem forced, maybe guided by some kind of invisible hand? Like, I don't know, maybe the media, movies, celebrities, music, huge corporations, and on and on and on? And the culture has collapsed on so many similar issues that I believe are all a part of this hidden agenda. The whole LGBT movement, for instance, is clearly a psyop which is short for psychological operation. But it's obviously been foisted on the public and they've been preconditioned by all those sources that I mentioned, like media and movies, to accept it. But really, the goal of the elite with this particular PSYOP, LGBT, is to swap gender roles back and forth over and over until there's fluidity between the two in people's minds so that there will no longer be any distinction between the two genders. And then the two categories will become obsolete, essentially synthesizing the two together. I mean, you can see this in the language that the LGBT movement itself uses. They have this term called gender fluid, which refers to a person who doesn't identify with any single fixed gender. So what's beginning to happen now is because our society is beginning to see gender as a social construct, the gender binary, the dual male and female aspects are no longer thought to be necessary. And so you have the synthesis of male and female occurring right before your eyes in the LGBT community itself. 
And I mean, besides the whole transgender aspect of it, this is also, of course, assisted by the bisexual and lesbian and gay sexual preferences, which also find their place in the acronym LGBT, because they also assist in the destruction of gender distinction, as one might guess would happen when a person believes a male and female aren't gender binaries meant only for one another. But also on the same topic, I'd like to take a second and point out just how absolutely devoted the elite are to this insane plot. They seriously believe this stuff because because the makers behind those highly Gnostic Matrix movies that we already discussed, who were the Wachowski brothers, are now the Wachowski sisters. They both became transgender for the sake of this Gnostic Luciferian philosophy of theirs. Unbelievable. I mean, these two are seriously devoted to finishing the great work at any cost. But another obvious part of the agenda is the current race wars that are raging in the United States at the moment that, just like the LGBT movement, will result in a similar abandoning of reality, which what I mean is race will end up rejected altogether as just another social construct, which I've already seen this idea promulgated firsthand. I am not black. I mean, that's what the world calls me, but it's not me. Along with whatever you call yourself, it's just a label. See, from birth, the world force feeds us these labels. Race was invented in the 15th century to divide people from each other, and it has worked perfectly. Who would you be if the world never gave you a label? Would you be white, black, Mexican, Asian, Native American, Middle Eastern, Indian? No. We would be one. We would be together. No longer living in the era of calling human beings black people or white people. But don't get me wrong, I mean, there's technically only one race, human, but we all have actual differences that shouldn't be ignored. We have cultural, ancestral, physical, like skin color, and even linguistical differences that make us distinct from one another. And there's nothing wrong with that, because no matter what race or people group you are, take pride in that, and take pride in the fact that God made you distinct and different from others around you. That's a good thing. And it's not like I'm saying one race is better than another, nothing like that. They're all equal in God's eyes. God isn't a partial God. And it's just that there really are real distinctions between different people, and we shouldn't ignore that reality just because some people are belligerent racists, you know? But another psyop that I would point out is evolution. Evolution essentially teaches that men are just highly evolved animals, which in effect erases the boundaries between the two. And what better way to get society to accept the merger of human and animal, that is chimeras, than to tell them they're already animals? And I mean, we already have examples where humans are mutilating themselves to appear more animal-like. I mean, it's similar to the transgender thing, it's just instead of becoming a different gender, they're becoming animals. And so the thing that I would ask about this is that how do you go about condemning bestiality and scientific endeavors to make human-animal crossbreeds when man is actually nothing but an animal in the first place? Do you see how they've rigged the system to collapse here? I mean, it seems that they intentionally pushed this view of evolution to begin with so that one day they can pull the rug out from under the people protesting such disgusting things as that. But notice that chimera crossbreeds between man and animal have been the fixation of the occult since the time of the Egyptians, and really it lives on today in the form of like werewolf movies and TV shows and vampire dramas and all that stuff. And I realize this psyop seems more unreasonable right now because it's so far out, but mark my words, man, you're gonna start seeing this stuff more and more. And just keep in mind that if you had told somebody in the 90s that gay marriage would be legal in such a short amount of time, they probably would have had the same reaction. But the evolution lie also helps the elite accomplish another key goal in synthesis, that is the synthesis of good and evil, or the blurring of the line between what's good and bad. Because if evolution is true and all we are is highly evolved pond scum, why not murder or lie or rape or a myriad of other things that past societies have deemed immoral? There's no real reason, besides fear of punishment by the government, so that the elite can keep people believing they're animals, they think they can make them act like it too. But it's the same kind of process we saw with the LGBT and the race issue. They're trying to blur the lines between good and evil by making good out 
out to be evil and evil out to be good. Then they change those standards so many times that it makes the two opposites fluid and easily interchangeable, essentially erasing any original distinction made between the two until society deems objective morality yet another social construct. But this stuff is exactly what Ordo Ab Chao, or Order Out of Chaos, means to these elite class secret societies. They bring about unity, or synthesis, through causing a state of chaos, as we've seen implemented with all these different psyops. But some of the more obvious psyops that are clearly being pushed towards by the elite is that of the One World Order I spoke of before, which is sometimes referred to as the New World Order, where there's a One World Government, a One World Currency, a One World Language, a One World Leader, and even a One World Religion. In other words, they want complete and utter unification of all things. It's always about taking the many and making them into a unified whole. But the last psyop I would point out is one that is meant to merge all the previous ones I've mentioned, and it's like the crowning jewel of the great work, falling just short in the pecking order of the synthesis of the Demiurge. And I'm of course talking about transhumanism. And transhumanism can be seen as the merger of man and machine, of biology and technology, even life and death though organic and inorganic is probably a more accurate way of putting it. The reason, though, that this is the one psyop to rule them all is because it ends the debate on the others. It's the capstone, in a sense. Because once it gets fully implemented, and humans start becoming fully machine, there can no longer be any distinction between sexual orientation, gender, race, nationality, not even species will be a valid distinction any longer. And morals? Forget about it, they'll evaporate overnight. Not to mention the simultaneous abandoning of nearly all religion, because who needs to worry about an afterlife when you can't die? I mean, the only religious belief that won't be completely erased by transhumanism will be pantheistic monism that teaches that all is one and that all is God. I mean, it's the very definition of the synthesis of macrocosm and microcosm and really any and all opposites because in pantheistic monism, all things in existence are seen as being one united whole. But this transhumanism agenda will be pushed on us by the appeal to all these other disunities that we've discussed, like race and gender and all these types of things. And people will eat it up because it will be promoted as the means to achieve world peace and to end hunger and to stop disease. I mean, heck, it'll even be promoted as the best social network out there. I mean, <laughs> there's literally no end to the potential propaganda behind this one. But in the end, it's just a furthering of the religious doctrine about the synthesis. And so, essentially, this massive plot that I've drawn out here is what Nicholson 1968 has coined the one game, meaning this is the true and final agenda behind all their plotting, the real end goal they're striving after, and they'll stop at nothing to achieve. Everything else is just pawns they're moving to get to this final step, and all of it is done to achieve the great work, the eventual synthesis of all things, ending with the Demiurge himself. Now, finally, I want to blow this thing out of the water and I want to discuss some key flaws found in this religious doctrine and its varying beliefs. I mean, other than the fact that it's just plainly absurd. So, first, I'd point out something that basically immediately invalidated this whole thing for me, and that's flawed logic when it comes to selecting opposites that supposedly need to be synthesized. Many of them aren't even opposites at all when you think about it, so let me show you what I mean by looking at a few. And so, first, darkness and light, which is also just speak of night and day. The problem is that the darkness of night, or any kind of darkness really, is actually what's called a privation. It's a privation of light, meaning it's not a thing in and of itself, it's a lack of light. Darkness is not a physical entity like light is. Light consists of particles. Darkness has no components though. It can't be examined scientifically in any way because it's a privation. So to say the two need to be synthesized is an utter misunderstanding of the nature of darkness. You can't synthesize light and 
nothing, you would still just have light by itself completely unmixed. And this can be pictured well with the yin-yang symbol. You have the light and the dark side. Well, if that symbol was based in reality, all you'd have is the light half hanging in midair, and you wouldn't be able to differentiate between the background and the dark half, because again, darkness is merely a lack of light, not a solid color in and of itself. So technically the dark side would just be see-through and non-existent really. And this is the problem with many of these supposed opposites. For example, life and death, like we saw in the Ouroboros. The Ouroboros represents how life is sustained through death, while in point of fact, life is only sustained by life. You don't get life from non-life. And this just shows how elementary these doctrines are. I mean, it's just like that Bible verse, claiming to be wise, they became fools. I mean, these supposed, like, pre-Masonic and Gnostic geniuses throughout the years, this is all they could come up with? Just these flawed, error-filled ideas like these? I mean, it's clear, they haven't really thought this through in a real way because what's actually happening in the process of this supposed circle of life is that an animal eats another animal which when it eats the animal that animal's body is still living in a sense and it has millions and millions of living components in it still so when it eats it its own body consumes the energy from those living biological components which then produces energy for its own cells so actually life is being sustained by life not death and again, death is also a privation. It's a privation of life. It's not an opposite state of being from life. It's the absence of life. Being dead just means you're not alive. And personally, I think this also touches the realm of morals in the form of good and evil. I would argue that evil is also a privation, a privation of good, like light and dark and life and death. The reason I say this is because in order to actually have any real objective morals at all, you need to have a transcendent standard by which to judge what is good and what is evil. If you don't have that, you don't have real morals. You can have an opinion about morals, so like what's right and what's wrong, but it's really the same as saying, I think the color blue is better than the color red. But who's to say which is actually better though? Our opinions are not actually grounded in the truth of reality, unless reality has some confirming standard for us to base our opinions off of. So if you want morals that aren't subjective like that, you have to have a real moral standard by which to judge what is good and what is bad. But then I would argue that we do have that standard in the perfect person of God. God is how you know what's good and what's bad. If something aligns with his character, it's good because God is perfectly good, and thus he's the perfect standard by which to judge what is good. And if God is a perfect standard of what is good, then he's also a perfect standard by which to judge what is evil, because whatever quality is not found in his perfect character is what you would deem to be evil. But then that makes evil just another privation, because God has no evil in him to speak of. We call evil whatever fails to meet up to the standard that is God's perfect person. And since God, the standard is only good, that makes evil merely a privation of the good inherent in the person of God from all eternity. So in layman's terms, evil is just a falling short of good. It's a lack of good in a person, or a lack of good in their actions that we refer to as evil. But then this means that the two can actually never be synthesized because the one is actually an absence of the other. You can't mix the two because if good became something else through mixture, there would be no evil because evil relies on there being good for its existence, in the same way darkness relies upon light for its existence. But another one that's actually one of their favorites is chaos and order, and chaos being a privation of order. It's actually the lack of a state of order. And so here again with this one, we don't actually have two opposites that need to be synthesized. We have one thing, and then it's negation. That's what chaos is to order. It's negation. It's absence. And some of the other opposites that are often pointed to have different problems. For instance, water and fire. Water and fire don't seem to be objective opposites, they seem to be subjective. I mean, why these two? Why not fire and air, or water and earth? I mean, all these just seem to be a personal opinion of what's opposite, and not truly clear, objective opposites. And another would be man and machine from transhumanism. Man and machine seems like just another subjective standard of what's opposite to me. Organic and inorganic seem to be opposites, but if that's the standard, then 
and stones and sand and buildings, they'd all be opposites of man too. And why stop at man if we're talking about organic? Plant life and animals would have to be synthesized as well, which that could be a potential goal. I don't know, I just feel like these types of opposites that they've come up with, they derive from just common conceptual ideas we have about the world instead of truly being based in reality. For example, cats and dogs, they aren't actually opposites in any real way, but to many they become opposites through cultural conditioning. Though I will give them male and female, they do actually seem to be objectively opposite of one another. Though it's hard to understand why that means they should be merged in any way. Again though, that whole portion of the religion, it just seems completely irrational. But since a lot of these doctrines and beliefs are centered in Gnosticism, let me point out that Gnosticism's standard of truth is just insanely low. I mean, if you go and watch the seminar I mentioned in the beginning about exposing Gnosticism by Dr. Michael Heiser, which this kind of thing is his field. He's a Semitic languages expert. He specializes in Middle Eastern religions. And he points out that the key texts that Gnosticism relies on come an absurdly long time after the events they purport to record and the people they claim to be written by. And so in many cases, these fraudulent texts claiming to be written by people who died hundreds of years beforehand is where Gnostics are derived a lot of these doctrines. Not only this, but these texts more than often contradict the earliest records we do have. And so that's why I said that they have this very low standard of truth, but if you're interested in a more detailed discussion of this kind of thing, please be sure to check out that video in the description because there's plenty more like this. But I also want to point out and correct a few common Gnostic interpretations of the Bible really quick though. First and foremost is that Gnostics nearly always present Adam and Eve's eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as a positive event, and most of the time they do this by intentionally twisting what is said about Genesis 3. They essentially tell this sob story of how mankind was trapped in the garden by Adonai, and they were basically thought slaves with no free will or thinking minds, and then they present Lucifer as this hero who comes and he enlightens Adam and Eve with knowledge from the tree of knowledge. The problem is that it's not called the tree of knowledge. They intentionally change the tree's name in order to make it sound more appealing and to make Lucifer sound like a savior figure for enlightening man with knowledge. But the tree is always called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, it's not a tree of knowledge, it's a tree of a specific kind of knowledge. The tree gave mankind knowledge of good and evil. In other words, by eating of it, they became moral agents accountable to God's moral law, and thus they became guilty when they fell short of that standard, which God warned them would happen if they ate of it. And notice, Adam and Eve are not mindless automatons as the Gnostic version of the story suggested. They have a full conversation with Satan and he convinces them through reason to eat the fruit. Faulty reason, but reason nonetheless. That's not possible though if they lack knowledge or free will, because if they're thought slaves of the Demiurge and not free will agents, how do they choose anything in the story? And think about it, Lucifer's no savior of anything if all he did was simply turn automatons into free will creatures. Adonai could come down right now and do the same thing with all the automatons that man has made, and the Gnostics wouldn't call him a savior or even give him the time of day. And that's because there's nothing virtuous about giving free will to an automaton without it. Like, you wouldn't sit around and feel bad because your Siri app lacks free will. But another text Gnostics will very often misuse is 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4 speaks of the god of this world who they'll make out to be the demiurge who again they think is the god of the old testament adonai but if you go back a chapter and start reading that interpretation is utterly destroyed since paul the author of second corinthians he just got done speaking very highly of the god of the old testament and the passage at the end of chapter 3 is alluding to exodus 34 so go check it out for yourself that's adonai that's yahweh the god of the old testament but even worse than that just two verses after chapter 4 verse 4 Paul makes out the God of the Old Testament to be the benevolent God of Christians. He does this by quoting Genesis 1-3, where Adonai creates light and saying it's him who has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ, which in 4-4, he says the God of this world blinds people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so clearly it's not talking about Adonai, it's probably more likely talking about Satan or Lucifer when it says the God of this world. And here's the thing, when Paul talks about this world, the God of this world, he's not talking about the earth, 
Earth or the universe or even the construct when he says world there. He's speaking about the culture that's against God, which the New Testament often calls worldly. When the Bible speaks about being worldly, it means immoral and resistant to God. So that's what it means by God of this world. It's not talking about the ruler of this universe or the planet, unless you're only counting the wicked people who are under his rule. Paul isn't saying he owns the birds and the trees and all that stuff. It's not saying he's the maker of those things, because Paul clearly says that Jesus Christ is the maker of all things. Another Gnostic misrepresentation of scripture, though, is when they try to say that the Holy Spirit found in the Bible is actually feminine. And they do this because in a lot of Gnostic circles, they believe in the Gnostic Trinity, you may call it. And it's the Father, Numa, or Spirit, the Mother, Thought, and the Son, who is the Logos, that is, the Word. And so they think that the Father, Spirit, and the Mother, Thought, came together and produced the Son, the Word. And so what they'll do is they'll try and go to the Bible and they'll try and take the trinity that you find there of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they'll try and turn it into the Gnostic trinity where you have the Father, the Mother, and the Son. And a pretty quick refutation of this is just to look at scripture and you can see in the Gospel of John, Jesus himself, and who better to tell us what gender the Holy Spirit is. Not that they have physical components that make them one sex or the other, but they're referred with either masculine, feminine, or neuter terms. And the Son would know the Holy Spirit better than anyone else in all scripture. And so what gender does he use in the Greek language to refer to the Holy Spirit? Well, we can see from John chapters 14 through 16, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. And actually, in the interval of those three chapters, 14, 15, and 16 in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit 18 times with male terms. And I'm not just talking about in the English language, in the translation, the base language that it's translated from, that the original author wrote it in. He used male terms in the Greek language. So, 18 different times he refers to him as male there and so frankly I mean there's no way around it after that I mean you can go outside the New Testament and pull some source that says that the Holy Spirit is female but you definitely can't find within the pages of the Bible that the Holy Spirit is feminine but you can find that the Holy Spirit is referred to as a male and so really the easiest way to refute Gnostic claims about the Bible is to just go to the passage and read the chapter or book in context 99% of the time you're gonna see that the same author they're quoting to prove their position says something else that refutes their position. Just like Paul, he often quotes passages from the Old Testament where Adonai is spoken of in high regard. Not only that, but Paul himself condemns Gnosticism by name at one point, calling it irreverent babble and saying that it's contradictory. And so frankly, I don't think they should ever be using Paul as a source. But very often Gnostics will try to make out the God of the New Testament, who Jesus calls Father, to be the source from Gnosticism, detaching him from the God of the the Old Testament. And I'm not going to waste your time going through the many verses proving this false because honestly, anyone with even a basic knowledge of the Bible knows this is utterly false. So I'm just going to flash some verses across the screen for you and if you're interested, pause and read them. But I also want to show you verses that teach that the pre-incarnate Jesus is also made out to be the God of the Old Testament, which they don't usually hold to that since they usually associate Jesus with the Source or Sophia or other members of the Pleroma. Though I've seen sometimes when he too is demonized by Gnostics, like in the Truman Show, where the cruel Demiurge figure is named Christoph, which is spelled like Christ, or in Maleficent, where the young king figure is clearly an allusion to Christ. And I would actually recommend that you watch Somebody for Christ's expose on that exact exact movie, and he does an excellent job pointing this out the whole way through. But really, all this just goes to show how all over the map Gnostic beliefs are. Because you really can't pin down all the things that they believe. There's so many different sects of their religion, and so there's a lot of contradictory beliefs throughout, just like you have with many religions, and so they're no different. But again, if you want to read these verses that prove that the pre-incarnate Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, just pause it and read those for yourself.
Beyond these points with scripture, this type of one world order the Illuminati is aiming at actually seems to be warned about by the Bible as being the kingdom of Antichrist because the book of Revelation actually speaks of a beast that rules the world that is an amalgamation of various other types of beasts. What's being depicted there is the four beasts of Daniel 7, which are actually four great kingdoms that rule the world. But in Revelation, the same four beasts are depicted as being merged into a single beast, having all the qualities of the original four all in one. And so you can see it has seven heads, which the original four had seven heads total. The head of the lion, the head of the bear, the four heads of the leopard, and the head of the fourth beast totaling up to seven. It also has ten horns like the fourth beast. It's like a leopard, the third beast, has feet like a bear, like the second beast, and its mouth is like a lion's, like the first beast. And notice there it even goes in reverse order from the fourth to the first. And so actually, it's an amalgamation of four great kingdoms that rules over the whole world. And not to mention, it seems to enforce a one world religion and one world currency on the entire earth. And so that sounds exactly like this plot that's being fomented by these Gnostics in power, a one world order that leads the entire earth astray from God and into the condemnation of hell. But beyond these kinds of logical and scriptural arguments, I would point out the obvious moral implication of this religion. First thing I point out is the method they use to indoctrinate people into this belief system. They never come right out and actually tell people what they believe. It's always portrayed in some secretive way, intentionally hiding their message from the conscious mind. Does that seem like the method of honest and honorable individuals who only want to promote the truth? No! It seems like the method of someone trying to trick you into believing something that otherwise you wouldn't. And that's another thing, right out of the gate with this, it's repulsively satanic. When you get to see the whole plot and perspective like this, you can plainly see that the people teaching it and believing it are utterly deceived. I mean, they've killed I don't even know how many people to accomplish this supposed great work of theirs. This belief system leads to an utter devaluing of human life because it motivates these people to kill innocents, just like we talked about with 9-11, not to mention how utterly egocentric and pride-filled it makes people. All they're concerned with is becoming gods, even to the point that they're willing to slaughter people for it. And I mean, pride is the main characteristic of Satan, even. And yet, some of them try to come off as if they're humble. Thinking you're a god is the very opposite of humble. I mean, how much more prideful can a person be than that? And I gotta say, if you're a conspiracy theorist or a truther, and yet you hold to ideas like those found in Gnosticism, it's pretty hypocritical to be exposing this evil Illuminati organization for the things they do, while simultaneously holding to the very doctrines that caused them to do it in the first place. And the first thing they should have told you that is that your worldview gets free promotion on public television and in blockbuster movies. I mean, don't you think it's odd that you acknowledge there's a group out there trying to brainwash people, but the things that they're trying to brainwash them with are the very things you believe. And so that's just something to think about, just putting it out there. But the real reason people would call this religion satanic is because of the fact that it takes Satan, or Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, though not all Gnostics see them as being the same person. But check out the video in the description called Genesis, the Serpent, Nakash, which essentially proves that the serpent, which the Bible makes out to be Satan, is the same luminous being from Isaiah 14, where the name Lucifer actually originates from. But anyways, essentially, these Gnostics in the content they produce exalt Satan and simultaneously de demonize the God of the Bible, which is the very epitome of Satanism, and ironically is exactly what God says Lucifer does in Isaiah 14. So is it any wonder then that we see the same kind of theme in these Luciferian movies and other content? Satan's just living up to his namesake, I guess. But also think about the way they negatively portray the God of the Bible as being a perfectionist, and then they turn around and positively portray Lucifer for his chaotic behavior. This is plainly a twisting of things. I mean, order and perfection are good things. Chaos is a bad thing. Chaos unravels life and leads to death. I mean, yes. Okay, granted, the God of the Bible is an absolute perfectionist beyond any level portrayed by these Luciferian Gnostics. I mean, they actually don't even do him justice when it comes to his obsession with perfection. And I mean, being a perfect being himself, he has an absolutely perfect standard which no one but himself lives up to. And because of that, it means he'll pour out his perfect justice on the head of every person that's ever fallen short of his standard, which is essentially everyone if you think about it. And that's what the Bible calls 
Gnarl's hell. And so on the surface, that looks pretty bad. But that's where the Gnostics stop right there. They don't go any farther with the Bible. They don't read into that, the gospel. But because he's a perfect being, that also means he's not only perfectly just, but he's also perfectly loving. And that perfect love of his is manifested in his giving of the gospel, which is what the Gnostics are ignoring about the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament promised the gospel, which the gospel is that that perfect God became a perfect man, and he lived the life that no one but that perfect God could have lived, and he earned for us a perfect righteousness that satisfies his own perfect standard that we could never have hoped to live up to. And all we have to do to claim that righteousness is to stop striving to earn it by our own efforts of wisdom or strength or good deeds or even knowledge. That is Gnosis, where Gnostics get their name. All you have to do to have that righteousness is simply trust. Trust in Christ. Trust that his righteousness is enough for you to satisfy that perfect standard. Trust that his death for you is enough. That it paid for every violation of that perfect standard. So that once God's perfect justice has been satisfied, all he has left to give you is his perfect love. That's the gospel, and that's what proves Gnosticism wrong. That's what proves God loves you. The God of the Old Testament loves you, and he didn't merely say he loved you either, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you Gnostics were his enemies, he died for you. What could better prove his true love for you? Words? Like him just telling you over and over in a book? Or maybe money or a new car? He didn't show his love by offering us beauty or power or fame and fortune or legacy or anything as trivial as all that. No. His blood. His blood was the greatest proof he could possibly have to offer. And so, if you're a Gnostic, or a Luciferian, or even one of these individuals who's involved in this plot, I'm asking you, do you have that? Has Lucifer proved his love for you like that? Has he bled for you? Is your belief system based in that kind of love, or is it founded on hatred? The God of the Old Testament, who you despise, died for you to prove he loves you. Love is greater than Gnosis. Choose love.